go. So last time we, uh, all right, we, we spent our, our time together deriving the, uh, deriving the Bernoulli equation. Okay. And I want to just quickly kind of to, to backtrack a little bit and, and, and remind you all of sort of the process that we used to go about that. Um, so the general idea was, right, we've got our normal, familiar kind of Cartesian space, in this case x and z. We've signed z to vertical instead of y. And we've got these things called streamlines, which are an Eulerian description of the flow, right? The idea is that the velocity at every single point in this domain is tangent to a streamline. Uh, and instead of describing things in terms of x and z, we set up a new coordinate system shown here as s and n, that is the length along a streamline measured from some completely arbitrary point. It doesn't matter really what we call zero. Uh, and then n, which points normal, perpendicularly to the streamline, right, as a normal vector, uh, toward what we call the, the radius of curvature, or the center of curvature uh, defined at that point. Okay, so we have all of these streamlines. Each one is going to have, right, at each point on it, a local, oh, that's wrong, a local coordinate system set up like this, right? And so this coordinate system is going to kind of move with our point of interest along the streamline. So then we pulled out the, uh, our, our, our familiar F equals MA, right, Newton's second law, uh, and we applied it instead of in our xy coordinate system, we applied it in our streamwise coordinate system. So we said the sum of the forces parallel to or along the streamline will elicit acceleration along the streamline of a little particle. Uh, so we're gonna, and that, right, by extension, we said here's our equation of motion. We've got, effectively, um, we said that pressure forces plus the fluid weight Right. Where these were our our F along the streamline, and then the acceleration along the streamline is given by M times A S. Um, and so we set this up, we expanded it out, and then we integrated it along a streamline, okay? The integration was an indefinite <laughs> integral. The idea was we don't, right? The integration would be ideally between two points on a streamline. And so we conducted that and what we got was an expression that says, I wanna change the color of this pen. Red is terrible. It said rho, or say P plus rho V squared over two plus Rho G Z is equal to a constant. All right. Um, so the thing to understand here is that this constant, right? We don't really need to worry about its actual value in general. This isn't a constant that we're going to look up in, in a table in the book. This isn't a constant that is like the gas constant that depends on the fluid. This constant, actually, all this is saying is that the sum of those three terms on the left remain the same at every point along a given streamline, okay? It'll change from streamline to streamline. You might have constant one on this streamline, constant two, constant three on this streamline. But the idea is if at this point you know the pressure, you know the elevation, z, and you know the velocity, then at any other point along the streamline, okay, if you're missing one of those terms, you can find it because you know that they all sum up to the same value everywhere on that streamline. So we're going to, I want to make sure we take our time to get through some familiarity uh, with the Bernoulli equation. So we're going to start off with an example of this. So I want to suppose we have um, a rectangular tank. That's very square. Okay, we've got a rectangular tank. It is filled up partially with with water. That is, um, it has a density of 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, 
And at the top of the tank, it's filled with air okay. um, that is at a pressure of at P equals 150 kilopascals. And that is the gauge pressure. Okay. Um, so that is 150 kilopascals greater than atmospheric pressure. Um, now at the bottom of the tank, we're going to go ahead and put a okay a little uh, nozzle here, a tap, okay, a pipe coming out of the bottom of the tank. And the question is, right? If we opened up a valve, this tank, then we would get water flowing through the tank and out through this nozzle. Okay. So our question is, at this point. What is the velocity of the flow coming out of this nozzle? Right. A few assumptions we can make here, or a few givens that we'll, we'll assume we know. We know that um, uh, if we number these two, if we number two points here, right? If we say point one and point two. Okay, we'll place point one at the surface of the water in the tank, and we'll place point two at the exit of the nozzle. We know that P1 is equal to 150 kilopascals gauge. We know that P2, right, if this exits to the atmosphere, just into an open space, then we can say this is at atmospheric pressure, which is 0 kilopascals gauge. So it's in equilibrium with atmospheric pressure. Um, we're going to assume that the velocity at point one is zero. Okay. There's a specific, um, there's a, there, this, this works in some cases. In general, if we assume that this tank here is much larger, that is, or if the diameter of this tank or its cross-sectional area is much larger than the uh, cross-sectional area, area of our exit nozzle, the idea is that the level of the tank is going to drop very, very, very slowly, such that its velocity is approximately zero. Um, okay. And then the last piece of information we need to be given here is that the level inside of this tank is five meters higher than the exit height of this nozzle. And what we're seeking to find here is V2. All right, so um, based on the topic of today's lecture, right, the idea is obviously we're going to be applying Bernoulli's equation to this. But before we just do that, uh, we need to go through the steps of making sure that Bernoulli is actually a valid uh, approach. Right? They're using the Bernoulli equation. So in the last lecture, we kind of, we, 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 I said these, and I said that they're important assumptions, but let's make sure we recount them. Um, we need to make sure that the flow is, like is the flow steady? Is it incompressible and um, sorry and homogeneous? Can we are we okay with assuming that it is inviscid? And are the two points that we're interested in looking at, do we have to cross any streamlines uh, to connect those two points? or are those points connected by a streamline? So um, the idea here is if we assume that this tank is very large, right, and that the water level in the tank, think a water tower, okay, a water tower and a little quarter inch nozzle sticking out. Uh, if we assume that we open the valve, um, the level in the water tower is going to change so, so, so slowly that it doesn't, those particles on the surface of the water in the tower don't have very much kinetic energy. Uh, then we can approximate this as a steady flow. 
Okay. So we can say, all right, we're all right with approximating it as a steady flow. Is it incompressible and, and homogeneous? Well, clearly we've got a compressible fluid in there, right? We've got air. But all the fluid connecting our two points, okay, points one and two, it's the same fluid. It's incompressible, it's water, and it's homogeneous. So that means we can treat density as constant inside that fluid. So we're all right with that. Is it inviscid, or are we okay with assuming it's inviscid? Right? Nothing is inviscid. There's, there's no such thing as a perfectly inviscid fluid. But is viscosity vitally important to the question we're trying to address here? And the answer is, once again, no. If we were talking about boundary layers, or we were talking about shear stresses, then right, viscosity is pivotal to, that, to those topics. <coughs> so we wouldn't be able to assume that. But for this problem, we're okay saying it's inviscid. And then finally, are we able to travel between points one and two without crossing any streamlines? Um, and here, the idea is, uh, th this is where, where the kind of interpretability of these problems comes in. We could make the, uh, we know that at the surface here, right, even if it's very small, there's going to be a velocity downward as the surface of the water drops. And the idea is that eventually, right, we should be able to see that this particle will travel out through the nozzle. And so the streamline, right, is tangent to the velocity at every point, and the velocity in the fluid should be carrying it towards the nozzle. So the particle at one is eventually going to leave through the nozzle. So we can make the case here that we are traveling between points one and two along a streamline. So if we are able to satisfy those four kind of requirements to apply the Bernoulli equation, that allows us then, zoom out a little bit, that allows us to proceed with the solution, which is to write the Bernoulli equation between points one and two. So we would say P1 is equal P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus rho GZ1 okay, is equal to a constant. But more importantly, since it's on the same streamline, that constant is also equal to P2 plus one half rho V2 squared plus rho G Z2. Okay. So in this case, we don't care about the constant. We don't need to solve for it. We just want to say the left-hand side is equal to the far right-hand side. And then let's start canceling things out or making approximations. Right? Um, we're assuming that right, V1 is equal to 0 because it's in a big tank that moves very slowly. So we can cross that out. We're saying that P2 is equal to 0. That is, that it's exiting the nozzle at atmospheric pressure. Yeah? So, quick question on the constant streamlines. How, like, what, what would be a situation where you would see streamlines being crossed and like what to look for? Well, that's the next topic we're going to talk about. But um, in general, the idea is like if you have, if you have um, like flow around a around a corner or something, right? If these if these are streamlines that are flowing around something that's curved, you can't apply Bernoulli's equation between here and here. All right. You have to make sure that you can travel between those points while remaining on the same streamline. Because these streamlines are going to have different constants. So unless you know right, what those constants are, which we don't, we don't ever know that, um, at least ahead of time, then we can't apply Bernoulli's equation between them. All right. So we know that uh, P2 is equal to 0 because it's e exiting at atmospheric pressure. And so if we're trying to solve that for V2, let's go ahead and isolate that um, on the left-hand side. So we could write, you know, move everything over, uh, 1 half rho V2 squared. It's going to be equal to P1 minus P2 plus rho G Z1 minus Z2. Okay. Um, sorry, we already said that P1, P2 is equal to zero, so let's leave that out. We'll just say P1 plus. So basically, what it's saying is here, uh, we know P1, right? That's specified in the problem statement that it's 150 kilopascals, and the rest of it is hydrostatics. Rho g times elevation distance difference between the two points. 
So solving then for v2, we'd end up with, um, well, if we solve for v2 squared, what we find is that this ends up being, um, we say this is 150,000 newtons per meter squared. We've got 9810 newtons per meter cubed. And then z1 minus z2, we've got this five meters specified in the problem statement. Five meters. Plugging these in, we find that v2 squared is equal to two is p1 over rho plus two g c1 minus z2 which ends up being 398.1 meters squared per second squared. Taking the square root of that then to give v2 we end up with a solution of 19.95 meters per second. So the beauty of the Bernoulli's equation is that right, it's basically it's giving you a known. You know the idea is if we have it, it's an equation that says we know that the sum of all of these things on one point of the streamline is the same as the sum of all those same things on a different point on the streamline. And so if you have one unknown quantity, okay, if you've got an unknown pressure or an unknown velocity or an unknown elevation, um, then and you know all of the terms somewhere else on the streamline, then you are able to get that one unknown. Okay. If you don't know the velocity or the pressure at a point on the streamline, then you're out of luck. You've got to find some other equation that can help supplement for those two unknowns. Uh, the issue with the Bernoulli equation is that it's really easy to apply incorrectly. It is probably the most abused equation in all of fluid dynamics because right, people will apply it across streamlines, or they'll apply it inside of a boundary layer or I'll apply it in an unsteady flow. Okay, it's, I'm going to try to make sure that we get enough practice so that we don't make those mistakes. But try to go through this process of ask, asking yourself, are you violating right, these, these uh, sort of Bernoulli's commandments up here uh, at the top? OK, so that deals with the Bernoulli equation, which right comes from, yes? So the, the interesting thing is, right, if the orifice were larger, you'd still have the same velocity flowing out, oh, right? But, but, but the flow rate, the volumetric flow rate would increase, okay? So it's that, it's Bernoulli that dictates the velocity, it's going to be the cross-sectional area of the nozzle that dictates how much volume you get out, okay? okay. So, right, Bernoulli comes from F equals MA applied along a streamline. The other part of that, right, the flip side of that is... We've got, right, we've got flow along a streamline, which tells us how things accelerate. But what about the curvature of streamlines, right? Acceleration across or normal to a streamline, which is what's responsible for, curvature, for streamlines twisting and moving and going through these uh, sort of curvaceous paths. So we're going to do a very, very abbreviated version of the derivation from last time applying F equals MA normal to a streamline. Because people with better artistic skills than myself have already done this, I'm going to drag in this diagram right here. So this should look somewhat familiar um, from last time, right? We did a similar approach where we said, all right, let's draw all of the forces, okay, that are acting on a little, a little block of, uh, of fluid particles. Um, and before we said we're only interested in the, the forces that are acting parallel to the streamline. In this case, we want to look at the ones that are acting normal to the streamline, which again consists of right the fluid weight right here, which we can write then as the weight normal to the streamline is equal to rho g to s delta y delta n, where this is the volume of this little uh, bundle of fluid, okay, times cosine of theta, where theta is 
right, the, the angle of inclination of the streamline with respect to the horizontal. And then we've got pressure, right, pressure induced forces, shown here and shown here. Uh, just as before, right, we used a Taylor series expansion, we said if we call P, the pressure at the center of this uh, small little fluid element, then we can do a linear <laughs> slope approximation to get the pressure at the, at the ends along the streamline. Same thing here, would say P plus, right, the derivative of, um, the first derivative of pressure with respect to the normal direction times half of the width of the, of the, uh, the fluid element. And so what this turns into, after simplifying, same way we did before, is so we'd say the normal force due to pressure is equal to negative dp dn times delta s, delta y, and delta n. So summing those, right, saying then some of the forces in the normal direction should yield acceleration in the normal direction times the mass. We could say then that m is rho times delta s, delta y, delta n, and the normal acceleration, right, we wrote this before, we said is equal to v squared over r, the radial acceleration. Um, so we've got all of our terms, okay. we've got the forces in the green and red, and then we've got our radial acceleration written in black, and if we plug them all in, rho g, delta s, delta y, delta n, this is be in the negative direction, right, because uh, the weight is acting opposite the normal vector, minus P, dn, ds, dy, dn is equal to rho, delta s, delta y, delta n, v squared over radius of curvature. Okay, so this is f equals ma. That's all we're looking at, f equals ma. Then we're going to divide through by this delta s, delta y, delta n, because it appears in every term. And what we get is F equals MA per unit volume. Okay? Because those three terms multiplied together are the volume of this fluid element. Um, and we forgot, I forgot my cosine theta over here. And what we're left with then is negative rho g cosine theta minus p dn equal to rho v squared over r. Okay, so what this tells us, take a moment to, to understand, what this is telling us is that the weight of a fluid element and an imbalance of pressure across the streamline, normal to the streamline, will cause that streamline to curve. All right. This is a fairly intuitive idea, All right. but um, what it's not doing, what it's not telling us is that, uh, or what it, what it does not say is that that fluid element is going to leave the streamline. All right. That's a very different thing. The idea is that that fluid element's path is following a streamline and steady flow, and so this is describing the actual circuitous route that streamline is taking. So if we have a streamline that's going in a it's completely straight, right? If this thing, if we had a streamline that was progressing along with no curvature whatsoever, then what that's telling us is that the weight that's pulling fluid downward is being balanced by a higher pressure on the bottom than on the top. Okay? If this thing were to then travel through a situation where you have, let's say, uh, you have a, a, a wing, okay? an airplane wing, which works by having low pressure on up here and positive pressure up uh, on the bottom. Okay. What it's going to do is when it encounters this, this imbalance in pressure, it's going to tend to, to curve upward. Right? 
which is one of the reasons that you get flow more flow going over the top of a wing than underneath. Um, so just try to use that as a mnemonic device and write down this equation, star this equation, because it's a very useful equation to have in case uh, you ever asked what kind of pressure gradient, dpdn, it takes to induce a certain radius of curvature in flow. It doesn't change the meaning of this equation, but if we were to do the same thing we did before, right? We had, we had a similar equation for uh, acceleration along a streamline, and we integrated it along the streamline. In this case, if we integrate it normal to the streamline along n, then we get um, rho integral of v squared over r dn plus rho g z plus p is equal to a constant. normal to streamlines. And so this is the counterpart to the Bernoulli equation that instead of being applied along a streamline, has to apply perpendicularly to streamlines. Um, to deal with this term, right, in Bernoulli's equation we didn't ever have an integral left over. Here we do. And the way we deal with this is going to depend on the problem or question. So we have to know how V and how R vary between our two points of integration in order to actually successfully use this version of the equation. And so we're sort of more limited in the number of problems we can solve with this equation. Um, and we're going to have to be a little more flexible in how we approach them. So let's use this to do a example, f equals ma across streamlines. So the idea here is um, uh, hurricanes, right? If you have hurricanes or these sort of, these sort of vortex-like weather patterns, uh, they typically involve These, more or less, that's not very concentric. I'm not going to have very good luck doing this. Let's just, they typically involve, right, circular fluid motion, which means circular streamlines. Okay. And the velocity of the flow, or the, or the speed of the flow, of the wind, um, in this can usually be written as V of R is equal to V squared, V naught times R naught divided by R, where right, R is measured outward from the center of the uh, center of our hurricane, and R naught and V naught are defined as some point. In other words, somebody somewhere has planted down a, uh, a wind speed measurement station, okay, an anemometer. They've measured how far they are from the eye of the hurricane, and they said, I know R naught, I know V naught, and generally they'll also know the pressure at that point. Okay. Um, so the question here is. Um, or what we're seeking to find in this situation is uh, if we know R naught, V naught, and P naught at some point, can we write the pressure, the barometric pressure, as a function of the radial distance from the eye of the hurricane? Okay. We're given the velocity distribution, we're asked to find the pressure distribution. So a few things to note here, um, right? Our streamlines, as I said before, are circular, which means that traveling along the radius means we're always traveling perpendicular to our streamlines. So this is a this should ring an alarm bell that we're going to be applying this last equation we just derived, which involves f equals ma normal to streamlines. Uh, so 
solution. Let's ask ourselves, so let's go through our little checklist again and make sure that we're okay with steady, viscid, And crossing streamlines. Okay, can we treat this as a steady flow? Um, generally, hurricanes aren't very steady, but uh, one of the things you can do in this class, okay, and one of the things you can generally do in, in engineering, at least for first approximation, is if you're not told that it is an unsteady problem, you can assume that it is steady. So here, right, we're not talking about a hurricane that's ramping up. Let's assume we're talking about one that's at a pretty s steady state. It's achieved some kind of plateau in its wind speed. So we can say, okay, it's steady. Inviscid, well, again, viscosity is not one of the, it's there, but it's not one of the defining features of this problem. So we can go ahead and say, we'll ignore it for now. Can we treat density as a constant? Air is a compressible fluid, right? So if we're talking about hurricanes, and in fact, right, the ideal gas law will tell us that if the pressure at the center of a hurricane is lower than the pressure um, you know, out toward the edge of the hurricane, uh, that it's going to cause us, right, that, that's going to cause the density to drop at the center of the hurricane. Um, however, those density variations are actually not very great. They're going to be fairly small density variations that aren't going to affect this problem. So we can accept this as a assumption, but understand that this is going to limit the validity of our solution. And then finally, are we crossing streamlines, right? Before, we said no. This time, the idea is we want to plot, or we want to know the pressure, right, as a function of the radial distance, right? If we travel along the radius, out from the center, we're crossing all the streamlines, but we're doing so normal to the streamlines, perpendicular at every crossing point. And so we can say here, like, yes, perpendicular, which means that we're going to apply one of these two equations um, to the solution. So to proceed, um, we're also going to recognize that each streamline Right, they are circular with radii of R equals, right, right by definition. Okay, we defined this script R as the radius of curvature of a streamline. In this case, if the streamlines are circular, the radius is, is clearly going to be R, or little r. Um, and then we also want to recognize that on each of these streamlines, right, we, our streamwise coordinate system is going to look like this. Okay, we're going to have S and N. So N points in towards the center, and R points outward toward from the center. So that'll come into play because in our integral, we would say that right, <coughs> N hat right, faces opposite our coordinate R. Um, so let's go ahead and choose, you know, we can, we can apply either one of these equations, but we'll go ahead and pick this lower one uh, to solve this problem. So if we said rho is equal to, or rho times the integral of v squared over r, okay, dn plus g z is equal to zero, or is equal to constant. Uh, notice that I've traded out our script r for our little r, the radius of curvature. And the reason that having n facing opposite r is important is because now this allows us to put a negative sign in this and make this dr. So what this tells us is that these three terms are constant as we travel along this radial ray coming out from the center of the hurricane. And so 
let's set this up at two points, right? Our two points are apply between R naught and some undefined R. Okay, some R naught is the point where we know the pressure, we know the velocity, and we know the radius. And R is, okay, it's a variable. The way we're going to do this is we're going to say negative rho integral from some arbitrary constant. We don't care what the lower limit of integration is. To R naught, V squared over, we're going to define a dummy variable here, phi, so that we don't confuse the R that's going in our integration limits with the one that's inside of the integral. Plus GZ naught. Plus, oh, I forgot our p here. That should be p. Um, plus p naught is equal to negative rho integral from c to r, our second point of interest, v squared over v d v plus g z plus p radius of r. Okay. Simplifications. Yes. So what happened to the row with GZ? Row GZ. That simply got dropped. Here, let me go ahead and put that back in. That should be there. Thank you for catching that. Plus P is equal to a constant. Row and row. Okay. Um, the thing is, we're working horizontally, right? Uh, the idea is, if we're if we're traveling parallel to the ground, then as we travel through the radius of this hurricane, uh, we should recognize that the z at any radius is going to be equal to z naught. Okay. So we can just subtract that from both sides, and it's going to disappear from our equation. And then what happens, right? Notice that, and we're not going to have time to completely finish this, but we'll set it up and we'll wrap it up. Uh, I'll, I'll post the solution, the finalized solution on icon. Uh, but notice we've got a definite integral right here. We've got a definite integral on that side. Both have the same integrand. Okay, the contents of the integral are the same. If we subtract the definite integral from one side from the definite integral on the other side, what we should be able to get then, for example, if we subtract, um, if we subtract this term from both sides, we can rewrite it as negative rho integral from r to r naught v squared for phi d phi plus p naught is equal to p r. We could get rid of that negative sign and flip the limits of integration then. And we could say, right, we've got our expression now for the pressure as a function of the radius. And we have, okay, we have defined at the beginning of the problem where we know that V is a function of R and can be written as V naught R naught over R or in our dummy integral this would become rho integral from R naught to R V naught squared R naught squared over V cubed D V plus P naught is equal to P sub R. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll post the, uh, the end of this solution on icon so you guys can reference back to it. Um, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday to wrap up Renuli.